Welcome everyone to Sports Performance Radio. This is the very first, the prototype type episode of Sports Performance Radio. I am B. Chavez from Evil Genius Sports Performance, and this show has been a very long time in the coming. Uh, some of you may know me from uh, my co-host position on a previous show. Uh, we'll leave out the, uh, the uh, beginning there, but the Power Hour radio show that was part of a, a large, larger network there. That show is no longer continued. Um, my co-host, and, or actually I was the co-host, the host, and I considered continuing that show at our own expense and uh, decided that that wasn't the avenue we were going to take. Um, that in itself is a separate story that uh, probably will get its own radio show at some point. But uh, the uh, the aforementioned host there, Mr. Michael A. Johnston, is uh, still a very good friend of mine. We still stay in touch, and uh, I hope to have him on this show at some time in the future. And at that time, we'll probably talk about the demise of the Power Hour and uh, just kind of the bad judgment and bad management that led to the the failure of, of something that really was good and, and well-liked in the community. And uh, it, it is a shame. But... On to my business. This, the the new the new show, my my show, um, as I said, may disappoint some of the old Power Hour fans because um, I just don't have the personality that Mike had. Mike was very good at uh, scripting a show, editing the show, a lot of funny bells and whistles, music, a lot of stuff. Uh, Mike's a very artistic, creative guy, and he put together just a fantastic show. And, I, and I'm not that person, and I will not be able to do that. Uh, I was brought on originally to the Power Hour for my uh, kind of my, my, my pointed attitudes and my scientific acumen, and that's really all I have to offer. So that is going to be the focus of this show. Um, my vision for this show is uh, maybe a 45 to 60 minutes max. Uh, maybe a 15-minute intro by me, kind of commentary on what's going on at the moment, and uh, maybe one or two uh, kind of bullet points that are in the news, and then on to the guest. And what I want to do with the guest is I really, really want this show to reflect me and the Evil Genius Sports Performance mentality and attitude, and that is no-nonsense, hardcore science. I want to talk about the things that actually work. So I'm not going to have these rambling, personable uh, interviews. And uh, and I'm not criticizing that. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, Mike Johnston, back with the Power Hour, did that and did that very, very well. And that's really the reason I don't want to do that, is because there are lots of people interviewing the people, about the people, what's going on in their lives, how they got to where they are, how they handled adversity, all of that. And that's great stuff, and that's definitely consumable, and it's uh, stuff that you probably should be interested in, but it's not something that I'm good at, and I think that there is a void in the technical side. I don't want to know about somebody's home life. I don't want to know about their girlfriend, their boyfriend, their sexual preference, and on and on and on. What I want to know is what do they do on a daily basis that makes them good enough to be interviewed? I want the bones, the nuts and bolts. And that, I hope, is what this show will become. Um, my my pro The problem... I feel a lot of times with interviews is that they're too broad. They're much, much too encompassing and so much gets lost. So my, again, with for me, for this show, my attitude is going to be to try to pin down the interviewee onto one topic. I will get world champion X, pharmacist Y, this, you know, chemist Z, and Instead of just, oh, what's going on? What's interesting in your world? I don't want to know that. I want to put before them one specific topic. I want to get a world champion powerlifter, and I want to say, what do you do in the off season to raise your total? How many days a week do you go to the gym? How many hours a week do you spend? How many total working sets? I want bones, bare bones, stuff that you can put the... Put the phone down, put your computer down, put your iPod or whatever the hell you're listening to this on. So you can put that down, leave 
where you're at, go to the gym and apply some of that knowledge to making you a better athlete. That's what I want out of this show. I want usable, digestible, appliable information. I don't want guests to weasel around, not answer me, want to talk about their dog and their kids. And No. This show is for the bones. This is for material. If you don't have something to say, if I am not going to put you on the air. That's what I'm looking for with this show. So, um, initially, when I uh, when I started preparing to record this kind of prototype episode, um, I uh, was of the belief that I wouldn't really have any uh, any actual current event type information uh, material for my for my uh, opening segment, and I thought, well, I'll just explain the show, I'll just talk about the show, and uh, that should be sufficient for the first episode. Well, as luck would have it, the the universe can be a very, very funny entity, and uh, it, it's just given me a gold mine, just a, just such a, a, a an easy target. It's like shooting fish in a barrel. Um, being the evil genius, being B. Chavez, head of Evil Genius Sports Performance, I search the web on a daily basis, just looking for in- interesting stuff, current events, what's going on, new material, things that I've never seen or heard before. And boy, did I just stumble onto something that, that just, it, it's hard to say it made me mad because I'm pretty much mad all the time, but damn it, this one's just comical. It, it comes by way of Instagram. It was uh, posted on the Muscle Sport magazine, which I'd like to say right now, I have nothing against those guys. I actually know some of the people in the higher-ups. Uh, they don't seem like bad eggs. But one, one, one little faux pas that I think will ultimately come back to bite them in the ass is um, they've hitched their cart to the imbecile Dave Palumbo. Um, just kind of, you know, sunk in the RX ship, and I guess now he's hitched to the next and see what he can do there. But anyway... The piece in, in question is um, a photocopy or, a, or an image of the print magazine, Muscle Sport Magazine, and uh, a segment they have called The Anabolic Expert by Dave Palumbo. And the first question is just so perfect for this segment, uh, I just couldn't resist putting it here now, uh, both because it's just it just highlights the stupidity of things and Dave and... And, and other aspects, as well as it just it, it, fit, it just dovetails perfectly into what this show is ultimately going to be. So I'm going to read this question, and I really want to stress that this I'm taking this from Instagram. I don't subscribe to this magazine. I wouldn't spend my money on a print magazine of from anybody, really. But a- anyway, here, here we are. The Anabolic Expert by Dave Palumbo. Question. Big Dave. I'm going to stop right there and say that's kind of comical since the dude weighs about 180 these days, but... Anyway, I guess that could be big if you're a dwarf or something. But anyway, Big Dave, I have read that Diana Ball and Equipoise are chemically identical. Very specific wording there. We'll come back to that. The only difference is that Diana Ball is simply orally activated. So what is it that I see injectable Diana Ball? Very awkward wording. Wouldn't that just be Equipoise? And now I have heard that there's an oral version of Equipoise called Boldaball. It's actually news to me, but okay. Wouldn't that just be Dianaball? Okay, so there's your question. Are Equipoise and Dianaball chemically identical? Very specific wording there. And the answer, Equipoise and Dianaball are completely distinct compounds. Equipoise is chemically known as boldenone undecalenate. That's absolutely correct. And Dianaball is methanstendrolone. That also is correct. Equipoise is a highly anabolic, slightly androgenic compound that in men is excellent for putting on lean muscle without excessive am- amortization and water retention. Dianabol, on the other hand, is highly anabolic, highly androgenic, a compound that builds muscle while causing water retention, aggression, and acne. So that's Dave's answer. They are, and I will... Reread that first bit. Equipoise and Dianabol are completely distinct compounds. Um, I could lead you through the complicated chemistry that is the answer to this question. Uh, unfortunately, the really the easiest way to do that to a non-chemist is through a diagram to actually draw a diagram of the root steran. Steran, as in steroid, it's the parent molecule that all steroids are. Um, 
but since this is an auditory format, uh, a, a stick drawing is a little complicated to uh, push over the air. So I thought I would go a different route entirely, and that is the auditory route. And in my hand, I have a hardback 2005 edition of Bill Llewellyn's Anabolics. And on page 126, we find the heading for Equipoise, Boldenone Undecalenate. And it says all sorts of interesting things about it, including said stair and drawing in the top right corner. Um, tells you that it has an androgenic index of 50 and an anabolic index of 100. Uh, that is very relevant. You should probably read that if you're interested in the subject. But on page 127, the very first full paragraph, about halfway down. I am going to quote directly, and this is again from Bill Llewellyn's 2005 Anabolics. Um, it is interesting to note that structurally, equipoise and the classic bulk building drug Dianabol are almost identical. Hmm. Bill Llewellyn, the writer of the Anabolic, literally the guy who wrote the book, kind of pun there, wrote the book, okay, telling you, chemically, almost identical. Uh, let's see here, it continues on. Um, are almost identical. In the case of equipoise, the compound uses a 17-beta ester, in parentheses, undecalinate, while dianabol is a 17-alpha alkylate. Aside from, aside from this, the molecules are the same. Of course, they act quite differently in the body, which goes to show that the 17-methylalkylation uh, affects more than just oral efficiency. Absolutely, that's correct. They do behave somewhat differently, but to answer the question correctly, they are chemically identical, save the ester. Boldenone and Dianabol, exactly the same root sterin. Don't know how somebody could go to medical school and not know that, but uh, sadly, it's true. So, there you are. Don't read, don't believe everything you read, and uh, check your references. Pretty easy stuff. Almost everybody that would take the time to read that magazine probably owns a copy of Bill Llewellyn's Anabolics, whether it be in hardback, softback, or digital edition. So, uh, that information is pretty freely available. I'm surprised that Dave would step on his dick quite that publicly. But then again, I've come to expect those sorts of maneuvers from... RX and company. So, anyway, there you have it. That's the sort of thing that this show will be. Not always to the negative. Sometimes I'll be very positive on things. There are good things being done by good people. Uh, unfortunately, that was not an example of that. And now, the exciting part. In this very first prototype episode, I have the privilege of interviewing one of the very best strongmen on planet Earth today. I am speaking of a good friend of mine, a two-time national champion, and one-time world champion in the 175 men's strongman division. And that man is Patrick the Cannon Castelli. And as I said in the intro to this, my goal here is to pin the interviewee down to a single topic. So... With Patrick, I hope to talk to him so that he can talk to you about off-season training for strongman. What does the best in the world do day in and day out to prepare himself to be the strongest man in the world? So I will leave you here. The next you will hear from me, I will be live on the phone with Patrick the Cannon Castelli. All right, everyone, as promised, we are here live on the phone with world champion strongman Patrick DeCannon Caselli. Patrick, how are you? Um, you know, been better, been worse, but all things considered, strong and healthy. Well, as we've discussed, you and I, and uh, the, the, the preamble to this interview as well, um, I want to keep the personable to a minimum, but um, you are a good friend of mine, and you are a s absolute genuine celebrity in the world of strength, so... Welcome to the show. I'm really excited and proud to have you as the first guest. Uh, there could be no one more deserving, you know, for a strength to perform show than the absolute best 175 strongman on planet Earth. So 
with that, um, Patrick, you know, just real quick, give us real quick who you are, where you've been, and then let's talk off-season tr- strongman training. Um, well, you pretty much nailed it. Uh, just reigning world champion, two-time national champion, uh, getting ready to run the three-peat here for nationals uh, another five or six weeks or so, and just hanging out in the Pacific Northwest up in Washington and working and going to school and training. Nothing, nothing else about that, but yeah, the nuts and bolts. Let's talk about, let's talk about the, the off season stuff. Off season strongman training. Uh, just, I hear so much craziness and to, to to add just a little bit more fluff, my former host, co-host, you know, good friend, Mike Johnston, uh, is still very active in the amateur strongman world, you know, promoting shows and helping athletes and he just really tells me that there's just a glut of good information and just a real lack of understanding of what to do. So um, you're the man. Tell us what to do. <laughs> well, um, the first thing the first thing I'd like to tell people to, to consider is, you know, this is – it's a very measurable sport. I mean, that's one of the things that I like about it. It's not, it's not objective. It's very, very measurable. And – with you know that being said, if you're getting into your competitive season, the first thing you really need to do after you know you're winning and you're celebrating, then the second thing you need to do is look back and reflect on on how that season went. I mean, how how did the contest actually play out for you? So I think the biggest issue I see is I don't, I don't see enough people doing that. I mean, they make it so easy. Evaluating for us, they, evaluating yeah. past performance. Yeah, they don't do that enough, and I don't feel like people – I don't see how it could get any easier when they literally post our score sheets and results after every contest. So it's not hard. You just get on the computer and download the PDF, and the numbers don't lie. So if you want to lie to yourself and you think you were doing fine, well, the numbers might say something else, and, and you just need to suck it up, buttercup, and, and be honest with yourself because, you know, that's that's the first thing I do after a contest is – you know, reflect, like, did you evaluate your performances and where you did well and where you did poorly? So, um, you know, with that said, once once I get a good feel for it, I'll basically take out the and score sheet I, from... I, can, I want to okay. try to interrupt you as little as possible, but do you base those evaluations on a single event or a series of events or a, a um, kind of a broader historical pattern or just... A bit or is that just... So I'll, I'll kind of take a, a, a broader historical look where I'll look at I'll look at basically worlds, nationals, and maybe one other show that I did that year. And so those will be my three main points of reference. And so I'll I'll compare them. One thing I'll do is when I get oh, if I'll get really analytical. I'll basically I'll pull up those same contests from the years prior, and I'll look at my relative. You can you can kind of match events and kind of see. You know, this event was pretty similar to that one. You know, they, they don't change that much. Um, so you can do a good enough job of looking back at previous years and looking at your, your relative growth from, you know, each event or event style. Um, and, um, and so I'll look at it, you know, how has I progressed from each event over the couple of years? And then I'll even look at, you know, the whole, the broad term of, well, if I, you know, won or lost a contest, where was I? Where was I getting those points, and where did I leave points out on the field? And if you can, if you can identify that, then I think you should have a pretty good idea of where you need to start your off season. I mean, my, uh, myself personally, the biggest thing that I've noticed is, um, you know, still to this to this day, um, coming back from Worlds, the two things that I identified as my biggest areas for improvement were still, oddly enough, at static strength and um, and a little bit of size. I think a little bit of size would help too. So, um, it, it wasn't that's interesting so much... that you mentioned that. It's interesting that you en- uh, measure a metric that's not actually a competitive number. Um, yeah. That, you know, you're you're considering you know physique, girth, and actual body mass as a strength performance metric. That's that's really interesting. That's uh, Probably worth the price of admission for everybody listening out there right right away, but that's that's interesting. Uh, please go on. Well, so the way that I kind of looked at that was, you know, if if it kind of started from you know more of the, the actual measurable metric of of saying, well, if I'm lacking in static strength, you know, what can you do to bring that up? So 
you could, you know, t- typically if, if we're going to say something like it's a, it's a deadlift event or, or whatever, like a standing, a pretty static in place event, there's not, you're not moving or sprinting. Okay. Well, then what can you do to make that event stronger? Well, the first one I always look at is technique. Well, how is my technique? If your technique is pretty solid and, and really efficient, you know, you're not going to get a ton of benefit unless if you're going to go to com- completely different technique. I don't know why you would, but, um, that's not an area that I personally feel like I need to spend a ton of time on. Well, if I'm not going to get stronger by increasing my technical efficiency, then, well, then how are you going to get stronger? Well, I mean, there's really two kind of big picture ways that you can do it from that point, and it's either going to be CNS driven or increase in, you know, cross-sectional area. Are you going to get bigger? Um, and that's when I kind of looked at the field of competitors, I kind of thought to myself, you know, I don't like to cut a ton of weight, but I still feel like these guys are coming in a little bit heavier than I am. So I think I could spend some time to to grow a little bit physically and put on a little bit more mass and still have a pretty comfortable weight cut. I mean, even for Worlds, I didn't actually spend a, a single minute of time, you know, working up a sweat to sweat off the weight. So I think those were the, the two areas that I looked at first was static strength. And then from that, well, where can I get more strength? I can get more strength from more size. So. Well, that's it. It's really interesting. I mean, first of all, like I said, the, the idea that you consider, you know, actual mass and girth and, it quote, the little rabbit ears, a bodybuilding metric as relevant to being a strong man. And then second, I want to point this out to, you know, everybody that's listening. Folks, you're hearing the absolute best on planet Earth today telling you what he's not good at. That's enormous. I don't think enough people are really that honest and uh, have, have enough circumspect view of, of who they are and what they're doing to really say something like that. So I, I applaud you, and I hope everyone listening really realizes the importance of that, that self-honesty is invaluable and absolutely necessary to be a champion of your caliber, oh, I at least agree. in my view. It, no, at I, least I, in I, my if view. You, if you want to get better, you need to really, really be honest with yourself. And, you know, it doesn't... It doesn't hurt to have really good, you know, honest friends who don't mind telling you where you suck. So. Well, it's interesting you say that because one other question I was going to ask you is, do you ever bring in people to assess your position, or is it all auto-regulated by you? Um, no, I bring in some people. Um, I mean, I'll, I typically when I when I go back and evaluate my performances, I, I typically do that um, alone. Um, just because it's one of those things where I just I really like to have some some quiet time and really you know a, a sense of self. I think if you're going to take a really good look at your own performances, if, you know you should. Well, first of all, if, I think if you really want to get good, you need to be able to start identifying them you know on your own. Um, okay. And 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 secondly, I think it just it helps give my it, it just it keeps it a little bit more honest. I feel like when you have other people in the room, you know, kind of giving you their opinions. Um, not that they're not valid opinions, but I feel like they might sway you from and, – and they might kind of influence your decision-making a little bit. And with that, I just would say just be careful with, with who you have, you know, in that circle. Um, I, I have a few people that I have in that circle, but it's a small circle of trust that, you know, I don't offer up to everybody. Um, and, it, I mean, especially when uh, um, coming up in the sport, I spent so much time while I was – hitting my more my, my successful stride and like winning my first two national titles. Um, I was with Zach McCarley a lot and he was one of those guys, you know, obviously much more experienced than I am. Um, and, you know, a six time national champion in himself. He, and in my opinion, one of the best, you know, 105 kilo competitors, you know, ever to be in the sport. But, um, you know, he, he keeps things really honest with me and he's a very, analytically minded person so it helps to have that kind of you know very measured approach yeah all right so we we have a background of you the very first step in your off season is really reviewing your last on season Mm -hmm. and you make honest and you know legitimate and honest assessments that you feel are valid so how do you then put that on paper or if you even put it on paper and then what does that look like on a day-to-day basis going to the gym to to make you better well it starts it starts off with a pretty big map um and and i'll kind of just lay out a rough calendar on a bunch of whiteboards or 
you know, whatever I can. I, I like something big enough, like a whiteboard, where I can really visually see the whole thing, and I'll kind of block it out into sections because you you know when the competitive season starts, and you know how long you need to get, you know, how long that first competition prep needs to be. And so then I kind of, once I've reflected backwards, then I look way ahead, look at the first, you know, contest that I have coming up that I need to take seriously, and then I'll actually work my way backwards. Um, and so it's funny because we, t- you and I talked earlier about, you know, this this linear progression that seems to be trending around the off season. Oh, uh, it's strong. It's man. enormous, and it drives Michael Johnston crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because I think, I mean, obviously the whole name of the game is you should be progressing some some way, some form. You know, you should be getting better than you were the last time. Um, so progression is good, um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with linear pro- uh, progression if you do it right. Um, but the biggest issue I had with that was, you know, early on in my career, there there wasn't any, there wasn't long enough time to really take, you know, set that aside and be like, okay, I'm just going to build, you know, foundationally from the bottom up. It seemed like, man, at one point, you know, if you're doing six contests a year and you take, you know, ten week preps. When when the hell are you going to do that? You're right. When player. when is an off season? L- seriously. Yeah. Yeah. It, and I mean that's a, and then that's a question you need to answer yourself honestly. It's like well okay well if if you have too many contests on your schedule you're going to have to prioritize them a little bit and at least figure out well you know if this is where the this is where the marbles are being played for then some of those other contests you might not you might not get to really train for and be specifically prepped for that show and that's going to be you know, I would consider them just a really hard training day on a Saturday. <laughs> really but, just uh, a skill-based event. You're doing it for the practice of competing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, that's completely yeah. valid, sure. Yeah. As long as your because expectation is scaled to that mindset. True, exactly. Now, I wouldn't recommend having that be something like, oh, well, it's just that's what I'm going to do for nationals. Well, good luck. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that goes without saying. If you can, If you can – you know, set those kind of uh, standards for yourself and and really know that, like, okay, well, then this is where it's just like you said, it's going to be the practice of the skill of a competition. Well, that's fine then. The majority of your training during that time period and around that contest is still going to be focused on something else then. That's probably going to take the priority. Um, so luckily for me, I kind of moved away from that and I started doing less less shows per year. Um for a couple of reasons. One, because I wanted to give myself a little bit more time to to progress was really the main one. Because, you know, like I said, I, I could identify early on, you know, even when I'm on my first national championships, well, geez, where were my biggest lacking areas? I was still one of the smallest guys. My static strength wasn't that good comparatively to them. And, and I was getting dominated in the pressing events. Okay, well, okay. then I need to take some time out of contest and hammer out those things. So, um, getting back to mapping it out on a on a whiteboard or something, um, I'm, I've always been just I, I block periodize everything. That's excellent. You know, okay. Personally, so personally, that's the way I do it. That's you know, if it works for you know every Eastern Bloc and Soviet country since the 1960s, that sure as hell is going to work now. Yeah, I mean, you know, when you're talking raw strength, and you you know, guys like Bill Kazmaier and Eddie Cohn got away with it quote, got away with it, you know, seven totals that literally are still un- untouchable today. I think it's yep. a valid approach. So yeah, you, you, take a, you, you take, you know, a calendar time, a temporal block, and you say, okay, for these 10, 12, 15, 20 weeks, I need to, and then what? what's the next word? I need to get stronger. I need to peak in a given event. What, what, what are we talking about? Um, for me lately, the the first block was was all about okay. Well, this is when I'm going to spend the devotion of my time is going to be focused on getting bigger. I need to slap on more mass. All right, we're back. There was a little bit of technical issue there, but that's going to happen with a new arrangement. Patrick, please continue. You're fascinating me. We're, we we've assessed. We've made some decisions. You need to get bigger and stronger. Temple, you know, block periodization. Let us have it. Give us a little bit of the actual secrets behind the cannon. What, what, okay, you need to put on five or even ten pounds of lean mass and get stronger. What does your month, week, and day look like? What are you doing? Well, um, 
this year I decided I was going to take a little bit different approach. The first thing I decided on, I was like, well, you know what? If I need to get bigger and I need to get stronger, you know, I'm only like a buck 80 or so before the world's. I was like, I'm going to dedicate a huge block to getting as big as I can, and then we're just going to block that right over into a serious strength block, and I'm going to try and drive my strength numbers through the roof. And I thought a really good way to to do this and have something to work towards, um, I had to set out a couple goals first out. I was like, okay, well, let's say I want to, I want to bulk up to like 190. It'll be the biggest I've ever been. So by this date, I need to be 190. So I've worked with the rab fitness and roger who handles my nutrition i said roger i want to be by one i want to be 190 how fast can we do that from here so we mapped all that out and i was like okay great we're going to get that big i'm going to switch over into a strength block and we're going to okay, have now when it. you say get that big is that mostly a dietary approach is that just a caloric issue or was your training weight training in gym training actually strategized to a kind of a growth quote bodybuilding arrangement um i'd say both definitely we definitely you know there's definitely a caloric need that needed to be fulfilled and, and a dietary arrangement that you know roger handled for me that way i don't have to stress about it um okay. but then i i myself changed my training program where i really didn't actually touch any strongman implements for a little while okay um, and i just you know so this I is was, pretty much a pure weight room approach this is all a, a, a gym aspect then yep and okay. and I just kept it really, really simple. I was like, well, where, do, where can I slap on the most mass was the first thing I had to think about. And I was like, well, I think my legs could get a lot bigger. <laughs> so I would just started, I mean, I was just hammering squats like crazy. I would squat three times a week. I'd press twice a week, and I'd deadlift once a week, and I'm just going to slap on mass okay. as best as I can. Just, very you roughly, know, we, what kind of what kind of you know uh, 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 you know total working sets? What kind of rep ranges? Was it holistic? Really, really give us a little information on what you would consider a this is going to make me bigger approach. Um, well, I mean, actually, I'd, I'd spoken with you about some things, and we'd kind of talked about you know total load and volume that that one can handle and recover from. Um, okay. So that was definitely one of the things that I incorporated right off the bat was you and I talked about that magic number of, of how many pounds of load can you recover from during the course of a week? How, how much can I tally up? And according to the Eastern Europeans, that's about 22,000 pounds per, yeah. per motion per week. Yep. And uh, I was trying to, in the, in the course of this interview to the listening audience, I was trying to really minimize the fact that I personally had any input in this because this is really about Patrick and this is Patrick's thing. But yes, we did consult and we did talk very much about that Eastern European, you know, concept of total workload. Add up yep. total number of sets, the total number of weight that was on the bar, and work out how much weight did you lift. And the more weight you lift, theoretically the bigger and stronger you're going to be when you're done. We you and I had talked about that. I'd kind of, you know, talked to a few other people but that was really the the general direction I was going to go. I mean, I wasn't sitting there doing leg extensions or anything like that. I mean, it wasn't. I wouldn't call it a, a bodybuilding. Just well, you know, it, it's funny, and I don't want to get off point, but I think bodybuilding to a large degree is a little misrepresented. You know, bodybuilding on the high level is this very detail-oriented, you know, leg extensions, little curls and stuff. But on the bigger picture, the difference between, you know, track and field, shot put, strong, you know, strongman, and then bodybuilding is bodybuilding is exactly that. It's about lifting a lot of weight over a lot of time to accrue a lot of muscle. It's really not exercise-specific. It's concept-specific. Eat a bunch of food, lift an awful lot of weight, and by damn, you get big and strong. And I think that's what you're saying here. Oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's spot on. I was just, you know, <laughs> Roger just ramped up the macros, and I just ramped up the volume as it went along with it because that was the other thing. I figured, well, shit, if I'm getting bigger through each, we'll call it through each microcycle or mesocycle, you want to label it, we were like, I would track the volume. And I mean the total volume, not sets and reps. Sets, reps, weights yeah. accumulated over the course of a week. It's going, something's going to have to go up as my body weight's going up, either the weights going up, or the sets are going up, or the reps are going up. Um, and so I typically just, you know, slowly increase the weight. Sets and reps were pretty, pretty, you know, standard for a majority of it. 
Um, what was, kind of rep range typically did you did you operate in? With basic, big, you know, we're talking squats, deadlifts, as you said, presses. Yep. You know, but I'm assuming that's both bench and overhead. What kind of rep range typically would you follow? Five to eight rep range, and just lots of sets. I mean, it, it's shocking how often that five. You know, again, a la eighty tone. It's amazing how that five sets of five really just crops up, even even when you don't want it to. <laughs> it yep. really, yeah, it, it's almost intrinsic in this thing. It, it just it's in there. Oh yeah. So that's huge. Okay, it so was, lots of food, lots of volume, and Patrick gets bigger. Now, yep. how, now, what do you do with that? What, and what, what kind of time frame are we talking? Was that six weeks? Was that twenty weeks? Roughly. Um, that was that was basically all of March, and all of March, all of April, and the very beginning of June. So that that's a that's a good ten weeks. That's a ten week progression to do body weight and and lift a lot of weight. Okay. Now, what do you do with that? What happens next? Well, then we decided, it was like, okay, well, now that we've got the mass and I've said I really want to bring my static strength up, we figured a really good way, you know, if you want to talk about static strength and you want to compare yourself, that was the other thing. I just said, well, then who are the guys who are just killing it in the static strength? What are they doing? What are the numbers they're hitting, you know, both in strongman and in powerlifting? I said, I want to know what are my competitors doing in contest? Like, what what does it take to win? Okay. So again, if you have you have these avail- these available score sheets to you, if you're getting killed on this deadlift for reps, what did the winner get? Okay, now we've got some some reference of what it's going to take to be okay. That that'll be good enough, right? That is that's what it takes to win. So then I figured, all right, well I'm going to compare that to some powerlifting guys because you know really the powerlifters should be some of the best static strength guys out there. So. If I could borrow, you know, from something that they were doing, then why not? And I figured uh, I talked to Roger, and and Roger is the USPA state chair here in Washington. He had a meet coming up at the um, in the middle of August, and I was like, well, what a perfect way to, you know, train to build up that static strength, but you know, have a little bit more of a specific goal. We want to we want the static strength phase and to be done and hit on this date and you know it's going to come to fruition on a on an actual platform and you know really get some solid measurables on the platform legitimate legitimate both in practice and in measurement outstanding yep. so we're talking block periodization a block to get bigger and overall stronger and more fit and then a block that literally progressed you to an absolute peak demonstration of your strength yeah exactly um and you know, the idea was, too, was, you know what, it's not even just like, oh, I want to get a little bit bigger and I want to get stronger. No, no, no. I want to get so, so absurdly strong for my size that no matter what event we have coming up next for the – because that's the other thing. It's not like I knew in March what we were going to be doing for nationals in whatever nationals is in October. I don't know. But, you know. See, I want to interrupt. I want to interrupt you here for two for two points, and I really I promised myself in the beginning that I would minimize my interruptions. But there's there's two points here to you listeners at home. There's two points right here that really really need to be hammered up. One again, we're talking to the absolute best on earth, and instead of riding on that, I'm the best on earth, and what I'm doing is right, and what I'm no no, he's looking at who's better than me, even at something that I don't even fucking do. Who's better than me? Okay, I want to be that good at that. That's what we're talking about here. This this person said, my deadlift's not that good, so who's the best fucker on earth? Okay, I want to be as good as that guy. Okay, yep. that's what we're talking about. And then secondly, something Patrick just brought up that's hugely important is, like myself, when I was a competitive power lifter, the three events never changed. We always know we were going to go out there and you're going to do three singles in the squat, three singles in the bench, three singles in the deadlift. Theoretically, a well-run strongman contest is, in fact, a bit of a surprise. You don't exactly know what's going to happen. So the concept that the Eastern Europeans used to apply to Olympic lifting is be overstrong. Be so absurdly strong in the back squat that no matter what the conditions are, when you go out there and do your clean, you're going to stand right up. That's what this man's talking about right now. Being overstrong. Not good enough. Be so fucking absurdly strong that strength is now not an issue. 
It's just skill and preparation. Yep. So, I'm sorry. I got on my little soapbox there, Patrick. I apologize, but that's important no. shit. That's huge. Perfect. Yeah. No, highlight it because, I mean, I mean it, it, to, me, to you and me, it's like, well, yeah, duh. So I just kind of say it nonchalantly, but you're right. You know, hammer that home, you know, with an underline and an exclamation mark because – that was my that was my plan. I was like, okay, well then August fifteenth we're gonna have this powerlifting meet, and I don't want to just be good static strength compared to other strongmen. I want to be good. I want to be like really good static strength compared to good powerlifters. Right. And then with that, I was like, because I don't know what the events are gonna be, you know, in March, what they're gonna be for the contest in October, it didn't matter to me. I was like, you know what? I just want to get so goddamn strong that whatever events that they have, they should be sub max like no problem like we're just going to hammer in a little bit of technique a little bit of practice and we're golden wow um so it, it, it's amazing and again I, I really don't want to talk over you but it's amazing how much of this stuff like we mentioned with the five sets of five it's amazing how much of this is really inherent and covers all sporting events the concept of being over strong that's what ben johnson did in 100 meters you know, ben, there was no reason for Ben Johnson to bench press 300 pounds, but you know what? If 200 pounds was good enough, 300 pounds would be better. Yep. He was over strong, and that's what you're saying here, is if you can pick up 700 pounds in a deadlift, then no matter what they put in front of you, you could probably pick it up multiple times. Yep. I Actually, it was funny. I was just talking the other day about somebody we were talking about. Because, uh, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. These, you know, cross over all different sports this isn't just for strong and this is for everything you know i pride myself on being you know a sports performance coach i'm not a i'm not a strong man coach I'm, I'm just good at strong man because i like to do it but you know and, and i was talking with a friend recently and and he was telling me about this research study about soccer players you know who did these quote-unquote sports specific agility drills with no weight training and then soccer players who did no sports specific agility drills, they just hammered the shit out of them with squats and, you know, great big compound lifting. And that was something like like 4.5% difference in times on these agility drills, and they had never even done them before. It's like, yeah, strength transfers. Okay, always. Absolutely. It's the only thing that transfers, actually. Specific skills don't transfer. Yeah. Um, that That's... You know, the old the old science of motor learning has proven that time and time again. Being good at something like what you're trying to do means you're not actually good at what you're trying to do. Yep. You take a moment to think about that. <laughs> it's for real. But the other side of the coin is, you know, being big and strong, you're always big and strong. You're going to wake up anywhere in the world, any time of day, and you're going to be big and strong. That's how it works. Yep. It's in there. You know, I, I actually remember Fred Hatfield telling a story, and I really don't want to steal the show here, but I'm going to tell this story because it's Fred Hatfield's story and it's for real. Fred Hatfield was talking about the the, the sports specific and you know sports drills and plyometrics and all that stuff, and he lined up three people. It was like a 120 pound woman, about a 180 pound man, and then Fred. And he said, "Which one of us would you prefer to punch you in the face?" And everybody pointed at the woman, and he said, "You know why?" Because progressively we get bigger and stronger. You don't know how athletic we are. We don't know how skilled we are. But you know that my fist is probably going to hit you harder than hers. <laughs> and there you are. And there you, and go. There you are. <laughs> okay, Patrick. Oh, so block periodization, bodybuilding esque, lots of volume, lots of food, a linear progression. You didn't talk much about the actual structure of that. Again, was it still that kind of three times a week squatting? two times pressing, one time pulling? Did you use a slightly different arrangement? Um, no, it was pretty pretty standard, just that exact arrangement. You know, it was Monday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we squat. Wednesdays, we deadlift two. And Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we bench. And, you know, on, on, and then another fourth day that would be more of, you know, upper back specific stuff and all that good whatever, you know what I mean, like uh, I hate injury prevention. That's not the word I want to talk about. Like stability and all this other good stuff. Sure. Yeah. No, there's that's definitely, the you know, definitely room. Absolutely. That's I, I see that. Okay, yeah. so that's that's really – and how did you progress very roughly? I mean, you don't want to give away the ranch or spend forever talking about the minutia of preparing for a powerlifting event, which perhaps many of the listeners will not do. 
but how did you go from this, you know, transition of, okay, I'm done getting bigger and, you know, overall stronger. How did you then refine that to day of the event, I'm the best I'm going to be? Was it just a total taper of load? Was it a taper of sets and reps? Uh, was it just a mindset? T- tell us how you got to that specific day. Um, I'd say the load was actually increasing pretty much all the way through up until the meet itself. Um, and that was mostly just because the weight on the bar kept increasing. And okay. the, I kept the total volume pretty much the same. Like once I kind of got to the point, there was even a week where I remember like I bumped up the total the total volume I can't remember what, but I, I remember crossing a, a threshold and like I was just feeling like dog shit after that. Like there was a week where I was just just trash, and I was like, okay, so maybe this load, this weekly volume, was just a, a, a bit much. So I scaled it back just a little bit, and I kind of just kept it at that you know threshold of the maximum you know volume that I could recover from, and I just kept it right there. You know, as the weights kept increasing. I didn't change the sets and reps really much. I mean, you know, I went from doing fives to fours, in the last, and I just kind of kept that range pretty much the whole way through the uh, powerlifting prep. And then, in, say, in the last like four weeks or so, you know, okay. we're going to hit a bunch of so, we're going to hit a bunch of triples, then we're going to hit a bunch of doubles, and then we're going to hit a bunch of singles, and we're just going to change the sets uh, to okay. match that total re- recoverable volume that I could handle. So I'm hearing a whole bunch of things here, and they're all staggeringly interesting. First of all, I'm hearing that you actually applied, you know, honestly and and self objectively, you applied auto regulation, and you literally said that you know I can't quite live up to this plan. I need to back off just a little bit. That's enormous. That shows, you know, that you're you keeping good records, that you're paying attention to your records, and you're acting on the information that you're recording. That's enormous. That in itself is a life lesson that every athlete needs to absorb. And then I'm also I'm, hearing... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interject and say, so long as you're not a fucking pussy. Okay? Exactly. That auto it's regulation, easy to talk yourself out of working hard. Yes, it is. That auto-regulation has to basically be earned. Like, you have to, like, I, you have to have a fucking a tolerance for knowing that this is not a comfortable process from day one. If we go all the way back to day one of the bodybuilding block, it wasn't fucking sunshine and rainbows and super fun and fluffy. Like, it sucks. <laughs> no, squatting, you five, your goddamn five, three, squatting five sets of five three times a week sucks. Yeah. It makes you <laughs> actually wonder if you have the right job. It, it, it fucking sucks. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. And if it doesn't, continue. you're not doing it right. Yeah. Exactly. If it doesn't, so, you're not doing it right. Yep. So, So continue with what you were saying, but yes. Okay, Auto-regulated, so, I so, over so you, but it's right, not like... So a, you yeah. actually, you know, relevantly and appropriately applied auto-regulation. That's enormous. And then I'm also hearing that for a powerlifting event, you essentially did, in fact, employ linear periodization. Yeah, for that last little so, chunk of time, so, yeah. So it was an issue of the right tool for the right job. Linear periodization peaks your absolute strength, which is very relevant for a powerlifting event or maybe an Olympic lifting event or maybe even a track and field event, but it may not be appropriate for the amalgam of strength, fitness, and skill that, in fact, is strong there. Yep. That's interesting. I would would definitely say that. That's pretty interesting because strong man is, in fact, in my mind, and, and I'm I'm very proud to be a powerlifter, and I, I feel that it, it was worth my life's pursuit, but I feel that powerlifting is an incredibly narrow niche sport. You know, you're really strong at three things. A strong man is much, much more than that. You, know, you have a cardiovascular component, a skill component, a coordination component, a strategy component. I mean, it's, it's such an enormously larger sport. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I definitely think that maybe the tools to achieve them are, are a little different. So that's interesting that you would apply a powerlifting tool to a powerlifting event and then change tools to prepare for strongman, which is where you're at at this moment in time because you just did a powerlifting event and you did very well, posted yeah. a very good total. You, you didn't yeah. per, maybe perform to your full abilities, but yeah. damn it, for a guy that's not a you know competitive powerlifter by trade, you're really bloody strong. That's that's a good point, I guess. As, as for someone who's not, you know, 
a power lifter. Yeah, it's good numbers. Definitely, definitely left a lot on the platform. We could. That's a whole other phone call of what the fuck happened that day. But neither here nor there. Absolutely. I still know. I still know that the main objective for that block, right, was we're trying to, you know, accrue as much strength as possible. What we want to see just static strength beyond reason for a guy my size. And I'd still, you know, regardless of what happened that day at the contest, I still know I'm stronger now than I've ever been in my entire life. I know that. Which is ultimately every athlete's dream statement. Yeah. So. So. So now here you are, and now you're about to transition into your actual preparatory for your stock and trade, the competitive yep. strongman season. That's huge. So, so really, our conversation essentially ends there. That's what you did for an off season. You block periodized, you know, get really just big and put on muscle mass, and essentially prepare yourself for a strength block, which culminated in a very respectable total in the 181 division on a powerlifting platform, and now your pre-competitive season begins. Yep. And I'm going to, I'm just, for all the listeners out there, keep in mind that we're talking about, you know, me. So, you know, you your your blocks might need to be focused a little bit differently where, you know, the, the few things that I really pride myself on and, and give a lot of due credit for my success in Strongman are my technical efficiency, my strategy and planning, my work capacity, and just my 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 ability to to recover in between events and my ability to push through reps and distances um is not is not an issue for me that's never been a weak point so that's not something i needed to work on i had to figure Sweet. out what i sucked at and worked on that honestly which for me honestly. was size yes. and strength so that's so, that's just that i mean for anybody that t- that takes the time to download this or listen to this you know live stream this, this is you know, enormous. You've just heard the outline, essentially, for making the strongest man in the world. That That's, yeah. you know, you're not getting this information a lot of places. This is what this guy did. You know, he pretty much laid out the four days a week that he goes, Jim, what happened, why they happened, and what the result was. And so now you are essentially in that moment of you are stronger, little rabbit ears again, than you need to be. And from now till the event, which isn't even really this discussion because we wanted to talk off season, but your on season is really just going to be maintaining some measure of your your present strength and refining your competitive techniques in the basic events. Yes. Yeah, basically, and just making sure that the capacity for work is still there. Which, I mean, of course, it is in the sense of the the total volume that I was handling up until this point is is absurdly high. So there's no question on how much, you know, the capacity I have to train and recover, but I'm talking a little bit more specifically about, you know, because you spent so much time, I I tried to minimize the time I spent getting ready for that powerlifting meet and hitting nothing but singles and doubles and triples because I wanted to keep some kind of rep range that, you know, would actually carry over to Strongman because, quite frankly, if you go to a Strongman contest and it's for reps and you only have the energy to do a single or a double or a triple, even if you're incredibly fucking strong, you're going to fucking lose <laughs> every time. Okay. The guy gets so, like me. Again, again, listeners out there, you really need to pay attention to what this man just said. What this man just said is it was enormously important to him to get bigger and stronger, but at every second of that, he was also highlighting that with, and I can't get too far out of my competitive zone. Mm-hmm. I still need to have the cardiovascular and local muscular endurance capacity appropriate to my sport. That's yep. what he just said, and you know, me using bigger, sciencier words. But at the end of the day, that's what he said: is, is I, I, I need these things, but I can't do these things at the exclusive expense of being a really good strongman. Because I knew when the powerlifting date was, that was one thing. We, I didn't know the official date for the national championships for strongman. I knew roughly it's like, okay, it's going to be October, November, somewhere in there. So, you know, when I first heard that the that the national championships were going to be October, whatever, it's like the third or something or fourth, um, thinking of, okay, where does that put me on a timeline relative to that powerlifting contest? That's only six weeks. That's a pretty tight window. So the second that I heard that, that's when it clicked into my mind where it's like, you know what? I can't get too far away from that. I need to be able to keep 
what keeps me successful in strongman needs to be within reach so that I can get there within six weeks because you only have six weeks to get ready. A little bit shorter than I would typically, you know, allow myself. But again, this was a different approach, and I felt really, really confident in the fact that the strength that I've accumulated will carry over and, you know, help and tremendously. Just fill so many gaps, yeah. Yep. And, again, the things that that I am the – thing, the things that I haven't been doing are the things that are going to come back really quick. It's not like – it's not like, you know – changing size and body type that which takes a lot longer or developing true overall strength which takes a lot longer okay i'm gonna have six weeks to brush up on some technique right. no problem yes you're so. just you're just refining very existing you know polished skills that that's yep. again very important to the listener out there you know oh world champion patrick castelli prep for the nationals in six weeks yes that's because he's world champion patrick castelli billy bob average in his first nationals going to need a little longer than that. Oh, yeah, and and appropriately so. All, all of that is very appropriate. It's not a knock. It's it's what it should be. That, and, and that other than is, that, it's, it's, you know, training the energy systems, which, again, you know, dialing in your energy systems a little bit for strongman is a lot easier and takes a lot less time than, well, I need to, you know, put 100 pounds in my squat. Okay, well, good luck with that. Right, right, right. <laughs> Re- refining your local muscular endurances and your – you know your your you know your ATP synthesis and glycogen storages and stuff. I mean that stuff that can literally be done in in 30 days for for most for most effective athletes. So that's that's enormous. Um, wow, block periodization. You know, honest honest assessment of oneself and just good old fashioned science followed up with just a shit pile of good old fashioned hard work. So, um, you know, here we are finishing our conversation with. World champion, you know, Patrick DeCannon Castelli. He's just launching into his preparation for his third national championship, which I fully expect him to win or get very close to doing so. And, you know, we can come back in the future and talk about how you did, how you prepared and how that worked for you. Uh, and I want you to, take, you know, say anything you'd like to the listening audience as well as how they can find you, how they can track you. And I just, you know, before I almost get mushy, I just want to thank you again and again and again for being as awesome as you are and taking the time to come and talk with me and to my listening public. That's just, to me, that is more of an honor that I can really explain to you. Um, so from there, Patrick, take it. Honors all mine. Super, super proud to be the the first guest on the show. I was really excited when you first told me about this thing launching, um, and yeah, couldn't couldn't be happier. And, and what a better way to show more support than than jumping on as a guest. That was you know definitely an awesome experience for me. So thanks. Um, to find me, what Instagram, Twitter at p canon castelli. You can find me on Facebook. Um, you can find me at canoncastelli dot com. C a s t e l l i. Um, other than that, I mean, you know, I think the last thing that I'd hammer home is just, you know, you and I talk about all the time that you're not a special snowflake. Okay, scientific principles apply to everybody. How you organize them is a little bit different depending on what you need. So that's all I want to say. You know, we figured out what do I need to do to get better? What, Where am I lacking? And then the principles that we apply work the same for everybody. Because I'm sorry, physiologically, you're pretty much the same. That's why modern medicine works. <laughs> it's not going to do two different things to two different people. And again, the simple understanding of that is why you're who you are. Uh, you know, never mind the fact that then you can apply it and you have the physical tools to do that. And but the simple fact that you understand that you're not special. Science has figured this shit out. And it's just your job, literally your job, to go and apply it and prove everybody right. And, and for that, I will say again, for that, I will say thank you. Thank you. No one says that enough. Thank you. You did the right shit. You busted your ass. You did the right shit. And you reaped the rewards. Thank you. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing some of these ideas with me. I mean, I definitely have, like I said, a small circle, but the sm- circle of people that I trust tend to – give me some pretty solid information and help. So thank you for that, and uh, thanks for having me on the show. Delighted to have you. I'm proud for my small contribution to, you know, your enormous success. 
Uh, and my contribution truly was very small. And uh, I can't wait to have you back. I really hope this goes over well enough that you, you can and will come back. And with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, strength athletes of all ages, the end of the very first show, Sports Performance Radio, brought to you by B. Chavez and Evil Genius Sports Performance, kick off with the number one, the best, lightweight strongman in the world, Patrick Cannon-Castelli. <laughs>